Hi, Marsh. Hey, hello, Paula. How are you doing? Hello, how far? I'm very good. Um, you know what I was thinking? Remember that the other day we read the Tablet of Ahmad, and I was wondering, you know, who was ah who was Ahmad? So I've read um, part of the book of Adib Tahirzadeh, the Revelation of Baha'u'llah, and he talks about Ahmad's story there, and I found it really interesting. That's interesting you mentioned it because I did the same thing after we read the tablet. So I just want to share with you, yeah, some of the things that I learned about him as well. Mm. Yeah, he, he actually had a very interesting life. Um, Ahmed was born into a very, you know, rich family in Iran and very rich, very influential, but he was not attracted to that. Um, I'm sure you have read this, that he was a very spiritual person right from the beginning. He liked to pray. He liked to, you know, talk to mystics and dervishes and spend a lot of time with them. And, you know, hear about this promised Ghaim um, that so much, so many texts of the Quran we mention of. So he, he was searching his whole life. He was searching for, for the promised one. But his family wasn't, you know, too keen that he was so interested in, in this lowly, um, you know, life. They wanted him to, you know, to follow their footsteps and, and be wealthy. So Ahmed one day just put some clothes in a bundle and said he was going to, to the Hammam and, and left his home and traveled around Iran for some time, again, looking for the, for the promised one. And then he went to India and in India, he, he met with Sufis, you know, with, with thinkers, with philosophers, like he would do these really long prayers. Um, there was one that um, he had to dress in white and he had to prostrate himself 12,000 times repeating a verse uh, from the Quran. And yeah, he, he didn't do that once, but he did that several times. So it, yeah, it really stood out to me that he was really searching. He was really looking for the promised one. And, you know, he was very disappointed because in India, he didn't find, mm -hmm. um, you know, what he was looking for. And he went back to Iran, very disappointed. Well, that's interesting. Um... Well, I read quite a bit about his life and took notes. Um, you're right, he really lost his determination. And so we came back to Iran and that's where he actually heard rumors of an individual who had been claiming to be the promised one. So mm -hmm. he really started to wonder. And there was one day there was an unknown traveler who he met and he asked him, you know, do you know anything about this? individual who's claiming to be the promised one and the unknown traveler points him in the direction of another individual mm -hmm. uh, Mullah Abdul Khaled he points him to Mullah Abdul Khaled so this is really where Ahmad's journey begins well actually continues as you mentioned he went to India now it's continuing in Iran uh, he crossed deserts and mountains um, really just a lot of dedication because he had so much joy in his heart that now he's becoming closer to um, the promised one and he finally goes to this mullah's house and he knocks on the door and he tells him that this is what i've been up to i've been looking for the promised one you would not believe the mullah kicks him out of the house takes him out of the house and he says, do not speak of such things <laughs> at all. Just, it was just a sensitive yeah. subject at that time. But I love the fact that he did not give up. You know, he get, goes back this next day, knocks on the door and he persists and tells him that I am looking for the promised one. And if you can help me. And so the mullah sees the determination and the sincerity that Ahmad had in his search. So he directs him to another individual by the name of Mullah Sadiq. So Ahmad continues his journey and his search and he finally reaches now the house of this mullah. And it is in this house that he, you can say he quenches his thirst um, with the verses of God. So 
this is the first time he is hearing the words of the promised one. Mm -hmm. And it took three sessions actually. And with all his soul and heart, he embraces the faith. So uh, it doesn't end there. The Mullah actually tells him to go back home and just not speak of what has happened. Do not tell anyone that you have embraced this new faith. Don't even mention it to your wife. So it just shows us mm -hmm. how dangerous it was again, you know, in those early days. And also there was this element of you have to find the faith for yourself. Like it was, yeah, yeah, I'm sure it was because it was, you know, also very, very killing Bobbies at the, right from the beginning. But yeah, also this element of search, like you said, that he had to go several times and then the Mullah saw that he was an actual, you know, ardent believer. So, so yeah, like people in those times had dreams and were searching and, you know, there was, there's these incredible stories. That's true. So now this is the third individual that Ahmed is um, basically associating himself and getting the help from to find the uh, promised one. And back in his hometown, he hears that an individual has changed his faith. Mm -hmm. And so now he's curious to see who is this person and he begins searching for this person and he ends up um, finding him. Um, and this guy was uh, Haji Mirza Jani. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, they meet each other and they instantly become friends. And they actually become the first and the only Bobbies of their town. Mm -hmm. So it was a very special uh, companionship that they mm -hmm. just naturally formed from the very beginning. And uh, Haji Mirza tells Ahmed if Ahmed is interested in coming into the presence of the promised one, if he would like to meet his Lord. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine Ahmed shows so much enthusiasm, mm -hmm. such. He just asks when, how, where, how can I, how can this happen? How can, how can I meet the promised one? So uh, Haji Mirza Jani tells him that I have arranged for the promised one to be a guest in my house for a few nights. And um, this is where Ahmed meets the ball. Mm -hmm. And I'll read to you what has been said about that instance when he enters the house. When he entered, his eyes fell on a face, the beauty of which surpassed heaven and earth. A young Sayyid was sitting with such meekness, grandeur, and majesty that one could not help but behold the light of God in his countenance. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, pretty incredible mm -hmm. what happened. Um, and of course, there were other individuals in the presence. It wasn't just um, Ahmed, the Bob, and the Mullahs. There were dignitaries there. There were servants there. And they were also asking um, the Bob questions about mm -hmm. the promised one that they had heard of. So long story short, the uh, other things that I um, was reading about was um, over time, the number of the Bobbies started to increase. But unfortunately, at the same time, the number of the killing and the tortures mm. were increasing as well. It was so bad to the point where uh, Ahmad actually had to hide in a mm. tower for 40 days straight. And his friends would, you know, bring him food and things that he needed. Mm. Um, what else did you learn about? I, I think his journey definitely continued him into Baghdad and searching for... Yeah. yeah, after that, he went to Baghdad because that was um, a center of attraction for many Babis. Baha'u'llah had been living there for five years when Ahmad got there. And it was really a very joyful time for Ahmad. Like he was in very often in Baha'u'llah's presence. He actually lived, um, you know, right next to Baha'u'llah's um, house in, in Baghdad. And he even has a tablet written, you know, in the handwriting of, of Baha'u'llah that says that 
Ahmed has, has gazed in, in, into his inner beauty, something like that. And that just goes to like, in my understanding that that just shows, you know, like, the, the understanding and the comprehension of Ahmed of, of Baha'u'llah's position um, in, in, you know, in, in, in his, in his role. So, so the, 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 they were there for a few years, but, you know, as, as you surely know, after some time, um, they, they arrived a decree from the, um, a decree from the Sultan that Baha'u'llah had to be exiled to Constantinople and then to Adrianople. So um, there was the Garden of Rizwan for 12 days, you know, Ahmad on the last day, that was when Baha'u'llah, um, his family members and a few, you know, a few of the believers left and Ahmad was just brokenhearted, um, you know, because the, the, you know, his beloved was, was parting and, and going far away and he didn't know if he would see him again. And Baha'u'llah told them all, you know, that they had not to worry that, um, they had to stay and teach the faith and build a community and 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 those that were coming with him mostly were you know the, the troublemakers so that you know they, they really had to to stay and and, and be strong and, and teach the faith and that's what Ahmad did for 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 several years he stayed in Baghdad and uh, worked as a hand weaver and you know made a living for himself and was very active within the community and um, there was a very strong community in Baghdad when he decided that he could not stand it any longer and he wanted to go to Adrianople. Baha'u'llah was already in Adrianople. He wanted to go there and visit him again. So, you know, he embarks again on a journey and, and arrives in Constantinople, which was on his way. And in Constantinople, he receives a, a letter from Baha'u'llah, which is the tablet of Ahmad that we all, you know, love and, and, and know so well. And upon reading that tablet, he realized that what Baha'u'llah wanted from him was not to go and visit, but he wanted him to go and teach the faith back to Iran, to the Babis. So, like, let's just, you know, imagine for a second what Ahmad felt in those moments. Ahmad had been searching his whole life for the promised one. He had left his home as a, as a young man. Um, he had gone around Iran. He went to India, came back disappointed, um, again, traveled throughout Iran, found the, you know, the, the, the purpose of his quest. He found the, the promised one, endured persecution, um, you know, fell into poverty, um, had to be exiled to Baghdad. He found Baha'u'llah, you know, the, the he whom God shall make manifest. Baha'u'llah was again exiled away from him. And the only thing he wanted was to be in his presence again. And Baha'u'llah was asking him to go back. And he, he obeyed, like he, he aligned his wish to whatever Baha'u'llah wanted. And he put aside you know, he, what he was doing, which is going to visit Baha'u'llah and he was going back to Iran. So I think he must have known that he wouldn't be able to see Baha'u'llah ever again. And yeah, it, for me, it's just touching how um, he just stood up and obeyed the commandments of, of Baha'u'llah. So he went back to Iran and taught, ex traveled extensively and taught the Baha'i faith to many Babis around the country. There's, there's this funny anecdote. Um, he arrived at the province of Khurashan and met with three brothers um, that had fought in the, in the, in, in Shakh Tavarsi. So they were really, you know, tough guys and um, they, they had really proven to be faithful um, to the cause of the Bab. And uh, so he sat with them and he started to explain, you know, teach them, teach them the Baha'i faith. And one of the brothers, uh, Mullah Mirza Muhammad, got a little bit agitated, so much so that they even, you know, broke one of Ahmad's teeth and, and you know, threw him out of the house. Um, but as you explained, you know, a moment ago, Ahmad was not deterred and he, you know, he went back again and he, he insisted that he had to at least finish his argument. So they, they sat down again and he said, um, he asked them to show him 
a text of the Bab. And that if, if they showed him a text of the Bab, he would prove um, that the Bab makes explicit mention of him whom shall, God shall make manifest as Baha. So uh, Mullah Mirza Muhammad starts breaking a wall, like he starts, you know, taking a wall down. And behind that wall was hidden, you know, a text of the Bab for his own security, but also for the security of, and the, you know, uh, of the text. So they open the text and the first thing that they find is um, a text from the Bab that says that he whom God shall make manifest will bear the name of, of Baha. So all three brothers became Baha'is and also, you know, their, their children, very staunch Baha'is. And yeah, I think there's so many stories of the life of Ahmad. You know, some say that he lived 100 years, others say that 113. Um, but, you know, what I find really inspiring, I don't know about you, Mosh, but that he just, again, he just aligned his wishes to whatever the Bab or, or later whatever Baha'u'llah wanted. And this, this obsessive search, you know, for, for, for the truth, this obsessive search for the beauty of the promised one, for the beauty of, of him whom God shall make manifest. And I just think like, what can we do with our lives to, you know, follow his example and, and also be inspired in this search for the truth, search for beauty. Yeah. Uh, and what about you? Well, you can definitely see the, you know, the flame of love that he had in him, you know, to travel on foot in those mm -hmm. harsh times, thousands of kilometers yeah. over years and years and years shows a lot of dedication. In fact, dedication is an understatement. Um, there's one quote I would like to share with you that really is from the tablet, of course, and it just basically gives hope to Ahmed when he went back home and, um, you know, if any difficulties were going to come his way. So Baha'u'llah says, be thou as a flame of fire to my enemies and a river of life eternal, my loved ones, and be not of those who doubt. And if thou art overtaken by affliction in my past, for degradation for my sake, be not thou troubled thereby. Thank you, that's beautiful. Which definitely helped me to solidify the <laughs> details in my mind. You know, I'm more familiar with the story. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, that was so nice. Well, I guess, Mosh, see you next week then. Yeah, great talking to you, Layla. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Bye-bye.